Hello and welcome back to Cooking the Books with me, Jilly Smith, the podcast which takes us through four food moments from the books of our favourite food writers. It's about all of life through the prism of food. And this week we're talking food and class and Jeremy Lee's book, Cooking. I'm with 17-year-old food campaigner at the Food Foundation, chair of Bike Back 2030 and youth member of Parliament for Winchester, Dev Sharma. This book really made food sexy and it made it so interesting and so cool. And that doesn't happen with food anymore. It's all ultra processed and garbage and bland and the same and grey. Dev's campaigning work to end child food poverty has won praise from Jamie Oliver, who says his work is truly incredible. Emma Thompson called him absolutely extraordinary as she watched him address ministers about food poverty. Jeremy Vine says he's prime minister material. It's already won him a scholarship to Winchester College and a dream of Cambridge University, where food has a very different meaning. I asked him to choose four moments from Jeremy's book to help us understand the role of food in Britain in 2023. So I really enjoyed the book. I hadn't really thought about British food. I didn't really know what to associate it with. And so reading this book kind of gave me an insight into what exactly are the foods that we associate with Britain, where have these come from, um, like how certain recipes came from the Vikings times or from Jerusalem and from the Middle East, and actually realising how culture and conquest played a massive part in changing our diet. I think the empire has played a massive role in really making food global and bringing British culture to be something that is global and not just something exclusive to this country. I think that's it's really special about British food. That's something that we should really take pride in, that we really are a mix of everything. We are. We're a big old melting pot. Tell us a little bit about your background. Tell us a little bit about who you are and where you are now. Where have you come from and where are you going to? Uh, my parents grew up and born and raised in India. They moved here in their 20s and then they had children. Um, and my mom is actually... Kenyan. She comes from the British Empire. It was around a time when my my granddad uh, was raised in Kenya, in, in British Kenya. And then around time of independence, there was a large uh, internal resentment towards whites and Asians and anyone being non-black in East Africa. So around 70,000 Asian refugees came to the UK, and my granddad being one of them. Um, so my cuisine normally is very, very Indian and it has like certain things from Kenya that I've come across. I've grown up in Leicester my entire life, been to state school for my secondary, did my GCSEs here. And then I won a full scholarship to Winchester College to study for my A-levels. I'm currently there in my second year, hopefully going to university um, looking out for offers this <laughs> spring. And you want to go to Cambridge? Hopefully, fingers crossed. Winchester's really been a blessing in a way that I've been able to actually think I have a shot at Cambridge in a way that I wouldn't have thought of before. And what's important about that and why we're talking is because you and I've worked together for three years now for the Food Foundation and you also work at Bite Back, campaigning for the ending of child food poverty. You're a passionate campaigner and when we first met when you were you must have been 14 Dev when we first met and you were telling me about why you got involved in food campaigning and just retrace that to, back to that classroom where you found out that so many of your friends were suffering from food poverty that was crazy 14 <laughs> that's like I'm gonna turn 18 next month um <laughs> so four nearly four years ago but yeah so I got involved with campaigning for children's health because of the Food Foundation. And one time they came to my local youth club and they came and spoke to us about food poverty, which is a really foreign concept to a 14 year old growing up in the fifth largest economy at that time, thinking we have the best welfare state in the world, the best healthcare, the best society, which is multicultural. Like we can't possibly be living in poverty. That's a, that's a concept. That's a third world notion. Um, and, when I found out and when they informed us and educated us about how I live in an area in Leicester where 40% of my friends live in poverty, where nearly a third of my friends grow up on free school meals, uh, where actually the food environment that we see around us is purposely designed to be unhealthy and promote unhealthy foods because of the fact our parents don't have much money and these foods are much cheaper. And realising that and realising how food a thing that's supposed to connect all of us can actually counter against us and exacerbate those inequalities that are already present. 
really, really angered me. I mean, as a 14 year old, I thought that I have the most opportunities in life to grow up. I thought I was getting a good British education. And then to realize that something like food, something so personal to me, especially being an Indian where food is such a rich thing, is actually going to count against me. In a way, there's this stat, which is young people in disadvantaged areas will die 10 years younger than their more affluent peers from diet-related diseases because of the food that they eat. And realizing this really hit this nerve in my brain. And I was like, I need to do something. I want to do something. I have to do something for my friends, for my younger brother, for the people in my community and for myself. Um, and that's how I really got started in campaigning about food poverty before it was cool and trendy around 2019. And you've done brilliantly. You're a member of the Youth Parliament now. You've been given the Princess Diana Award for your campaigning. I mean, you've done so much. You've never stopped. What is it, do you think, that that really drives you? Is it because you've got a platform through working through the Food Foundation and, and now with Bite Back too? Is that it? Or what drives you? I, I'm so grateful of the platform that the Food Foundation and Bite Back have given me. And I think what this stems from is lived experience. Um, what drives me is the lived experience of growing up in a broken food system. And what Bite Back and the Food Foundation have done is shed a light on that and expose that inequality and injustice. And with my generation, the thing is, when we come to know of injustices, I think it's just wholly with Gen Z, we want to speak about it. We want to shine a light on it. We're not going to stay silent. And so my lived experience of growing up in a broken food system, in a disadvantaged area, seeing this happen firsthand, alongside the Food Foundation and Bite Back, giving and shedding light on this issue and giving me a platform to speak up ha has meant that I feel, and I think I started with a sense of urgency and a sense of need of having to speak up about it. I think it's, it's grown, that sense of urgency has grown of being like, if I don't say something, then it's only going to get worse and it's going to get worse for my children. It's going to get yes, worse for my younger brother and for all my cousins. I'm the oldest cousin of around seven. And so to see all of them growing up, uh, I think like it really hones down the sense of urgency. Uh, and also yeah. just to add, um, I think once you have been exposed and you know the truth and you really understand how the food system works, when you look around and you do your daily shop or you go with your parents to the supermarket or you take your younger sibling to school, you start to notice these things popping out at you. This manip the manipulation by the food industry, the continuous bombardment of junk food advertising, the, the food poverty. You can see how the system is exactly working against you and you can see it happen in real life and that is a horrid feeling that is scary and it is scary to see your community and your friends and your own family suffer from the health consequences of that system yeah it is all about two different worlds um you know i as a food journalist i've been writing about food and health for 30 years and you know i'm cooking the books every week i have a different person talking about their food book a lot of them do come from your kind of background of ashi Rowe, uh it was an indian writer whose family were brought up in uh, tanzania there's ravinda bogle who also grew up in kenya uh you know lots of people with similar backgrounds to yours but they inhabit a different world now because because of their success. And something like the world that Jeremy Lee is talking about is a million miles away from what you're talking about and, and the kind of work that we do for the Food Foundation podcast. And it feels to me that the people in power are, are much more likely to be living in the Jeremy Lee world. Does it feel like it's that division between this the haves and the have-nots? What I got from the Jeremy Lee book was that this was a book for people who have money and spare time and have uh, a disposable income to create these incredibly beautiful recipes that, was, that look so tasty and look so good and are healthy, convenient and accessible. And I think there's this massive disconnect between those who have and those who don't. To my friends and to my community, what's important for food is, is it convenient? Is it accessible? And is it cheap? And so the convenience factor of being able to buy a McDonald's or some fast food is so easy because you can get it from just, you know, you just walk in, you buy it, it's ready made. It's this illusion of what is cheap and not. And 
the fact that healthy food can be very cheap and affordable and very nice to make. For example, the lentil soup, like what is then the problem is the convenience. And it's the fact that if a mother, a single mother is working two jobs, where is she going to find the time to be able to cook this in the recipe, which takes at least half hour and you have to leave it for two hours in the fridge and etc, etc. Et well, this is your first food moment. So let's just alight on the lentil soup. Now, you made this with your mum and your grandma, yeah. didn't you? Yeah. So first of all, tell us about the actual recipe. What was so great about it? Why did you choose that one of all the different recipes in the book? So... I feel like lentil soup is something that I is very personal to me and I keep bringing back this thing of my Indian heritage that's been a massive part of my food upbringing and it's because I've grown up eating Indian food and lentil soup was such a thing that I always associated to be very Indian not British um, and so when I saw it in this book I was immediately like I need to try this recipe and I need to see how it alters from the one that my parents make and my grandmother makes uh, so i'm really blessed that my grandmother has come over from india right now for our holidays and so uh, we we like made this recipe together lentil soup uh, did you make it with the ham hock um no we uh no we didn't put any of the meat in it so we mm -hmm. did it with that she's vegetarian exactly yeah yeah but the best thing about the jeremy lee book was all these recipes have a vegetarian version with it he would just yeah. say if you want to put the meat in yeah. what i like really liked about it was that at home we already have the lentils here i think that was a real reason too and this is again like if you have the foods at home if you have them here it's much more convenient and easy to make it and you're more likely to um yeah i, I think yeah what, with what this book like it's it's amazing and i really really like the recipes but a lot of the things families would have to actively go to supermarkets and buy these products individually some things i had never even heard of before and then construct it like a diy ikea a product <laughs> um, <laughs> but one of the things that jeremy lee talks about is the market mm -hmm. and how important ingredients yeah. are. And of course, where you live in Leicester, there's one of the best markets mm -hmm. in the entire country. But when you go down there with your mum mm -hmm. and you're buying all the foods that you would have in your very stable food culture mm -hmm. at home, you know, how does that compare with the kind of ingredients that you get at Winchester College? I presume you get quite good food at Winchester College where, you know, Keir Starmer and Rishi Sunak <laughs> both went. So like, the market is such a blessing because Leicester has a very diverse culture um, and a, an incredibly diverse heritage alongside with it. We have so many different nationalities living in our city and so we have Leicester Market one of the largest markets in Europe which has all these different nationalities and all these foods in one area our family use it quite a lot and my mom especially to get foods it's very much like the things you see in the movies of people are like you know one pound fifty one pound fifty in a bag oh no okay we're gonna kind of like haggle you and lower the price okay now i'll do this for you but you my so friend it's fun. it's fun it's interactive it makes food sexy again this is the thing yeah. right this book really made food sexy and it made it so interesting and so cool and that doesn't happen with food anymore. It's all ultra processed and garbage and bland and the same and grey. Um, and I think that's what like my association with food has been from a young child of being very sexy and colourful. Um, mm. And then with Winchester food. So I can talk about school food from two different settings. I can talk about it from my state school in Leicester. And then I can talk about it from Winchester College. And I've learnt how lunch and food in general is a connector how food is meant to not only be an education but also meant to be some a uh, moment to connect you with others and other cultures so for example at winchester we have lunch served with a teacher where the food is left on the table and we then have to serve each other and mm -hmm. then after our prayer we can only eat once every we, yeah. could, we have to we have to start eating together and so it's very it's about teaching you manners as well it really is yeah 
And it's very different from the kind of the the canteen style that you would have got at your state school, isn't it? Mm-hmm. But that is about gentrification, isn't it? It's about teaching you how to behave well in the dining halls of power where you are being trained to go. It's really interesting that you've already noticed mm-hmm. that food is a big part of that. Food is a language that's very much trained to you at Winchester. Uh, the fact that there are certain manners and ways to eat, you know, this fork should be here, this spoon should be here. Uh, things that I hadn't really been trained about before, but are unspoken skills and are learned behaviours. Uh, and learning this at a young age means when you are climbing the social rank or going to jobs or going to dinners, you're not the odd one out and you can kind of blend in. Uh, and again, food is a language we get served beautiful foods from different cultures and the fact that I'm able to explore my taste buds in a way that is fun healthy and tasty is an incredible privilege and that really differs from my state school because I feel like there's just not enough money in school food to be able to give you something that is you know really different it was always the pizzas the ultra processed food the burgers it was easy it was cheap it was just what we associated school food to be yeah, and yet Chefs in Schools is doing exactly that. Incredible They're showing stuff. how much fun you can have with school food and you can, and great ingredients and just bringing it all alive. Yeah, that really needs to go into state education too. Your second food moment, the Pom Anna. I thought, wow, that's a really interesting choice. This came from uh, Jeremy Lee was a chef at a gentleman's club called Boodles on St. James's Street in the heart of London when he first left Scotland and it's a very pretty dish it's you know it's very easy but it looks incredibly professional I wonder if that's the kind of dish that you get on the table at Winchester for your dinner or your lunch is it it very much is I mean when at Winchester I've suddenly developed a love for potatoes (laughs) and potato based (laughs) dishes so this is one reason why I chose the Palmana it's like the the crust and the edge of it, the potato, the the Frenchness that and the Britishness fused together to create this amazing dish, and it makes me think of, um, you know how delicious potatoes really are, how buttery you can make them, and how they all mold together to create this lovely dish, um, and so that was kind of inspired, yeah, by my my food uh, revelation at Winchester, but also. Uh, like my certain new love for potatoes also the fact that it's like you said it's a gentleman's club dish it's very much quite it's quite classy it's quite different to put on the dinner table um and that was one reason i also chose it yeah the the third food moment is really interesting uh you've chosen the potato pancakes and smoked deal and poached eggs and horseradish and i don't know if you know this because it doesn't actually say this in the book but smoked deal has been on a jeremy lee menu wherever he's been since the mid-90s it is quintessential jeremy lee but it's so interesting that you've kind of landed on the essence of the man why did you choose those so I think Jeremy Lee's onto something here because there's this current Gen Z culture moment where we're obsessed with brunch and it being really healthy and Instagrammable. And I feel like pancakes are a thing that are very much brunchy. We've also associated with breakfast. But now when I see my friends on social media or when I go out with my friends to brunch, we very much are having, you know, pancakes with smoked eel, with eggs and these things. In a healthy format, we're having something which we normally associate pancakes to be really unhealthy with something which is now quite good for you and quite healthy and really nutritious. Yeah, good spot, good spot. In fact, the best pancake house in Brighton, where I live, has always got a queue of Japanese tourists (laughs) doing all the Instagram stuff right Mm -hmm. outside it. Your final food moment is the Salma Gundi, the warm roast chicken salad with summer slaw. Now, this feels part of British history. Yeah. I mean, first of all, why did you choose it? And then tell me if you've ever tasted anything like this. It's that Winchester moment again. It's the fact that chicken salad is something I hadn't really tried before when I was living here in Leicester. It's quite easy to make and it encompasses so many different factors of food and so many different aspects of food and puts it together in an easy way. It's one of my personal favourites too. Like I normally make this. So when I saw this, I was like, I'm going to take this recipe and add Jeremy Lee's spin to it. How 
aware are you of the kind of the roast meats as part of British food culture? Is there anywhere in your education where food culture is passed along? Not much, to be honest. I We, of course, associate the turkey with Christmas and we're taught that, but not much about salads and not much about food culture is really taught to us at a young age or even in education. But please, I want to know more. Well, you just don't need to listen to cooking the books, actually, and it'll teach you everything you need to know. <laughs> um, but if you think about the Tudors, for example, uh, and you think about those massive great feasts, what do you see in your mind's eye on the table? During times of empire, you start seeing a lot of spices and being infused. But what I do imagine is meat on the table. Four and twenty blackbirds baked in a pie. It was all about the show, wasn't it? It was co- cutting it open and then birds within birds. I mean, it was uh, really quite extraordinary. Oh, very much. There's large banquets with, you know, where it's all a spectacular and it was meant to be a show. Oh, yeah, and, and the pies, of course. Pies are uniquely British, something this book has taught me. And the fact that they go back hundreds of years, something like the pies, the meat on the table, all infused together. Yeah. It's really is great. Yeah, exactly that. I mean, it's interesting that Jeremy Lee calls this book uh, cooking simply and well. It is actually incredibly simple. A lot of the recipes are very, very simple, certainly all the ones that you've chosen. Well is an interesting word. You're right to say that this really isn't a book that you would necessarily buy for your parents. It's for a particular kind of person, probably who goes to the Quo Vardis Members Club, where food is as you say, a language that you share with people like you. It's a power play. If the people who we're talking about, who live every day in food insecurity, could be given recipes that were as simple as these, what are the barriers to cooking well? Food isn't sexy. It's not sexy enough. I think with the people that we're talking to at the Food Foundation and the everyday person, right now they have no link with food. There really isn't anything that traces a lot of people in this country to a certain type of cuisine. There's been this Americanization of food in the UK especially. And I think a lot of people now consider burgers and pizzas to be a staple part of our diet. I think we need a massive culture shift. We need people to really associate with their food and have some sort of linkage with it. Of course, that comes through education, but it also comes through making food sexier and making it nicer. What this book has done is it's really like the way it describes it leaves this taste in your mouth, even though you haven't tried it. It really makes you think that this food is cool and really it and part of culture. And if we do that with recipes and foods that are very easy and affordable and very nutritious for a lot of families, then we can hopefully get back to a narrative in society where we think eating healthy foods is cool and nice. I think it's the de-gentrification of food, of making food accessible for all and saying that these sorts of recipes aren't exclusive just for those with money and friends spare time, but actually they are very easy to make and simple. Maybe what we need is Iceland to make a ready-made lentil soup that can go in the microwave rather than, uh, you know, high fat and salt and sugar pizza that is cooked in two minutes like they are currently doing and cost 70p. Jamie Oliver is one of many people who has been banging this drum for a very, very long time. It's the same message as it's ever been. Mm -hmm. Why don't people listen and why don't people in power make the changes that have to be made for the food system? Historically, I think there's been a narrative around children's health and food that's been very counteractive. I think we've immediately blamed the individual and we've always uh, put the blame back on working class families and working class people. There's been a lot of behavioural science where we realised that in order to get people to understand food and understand this issue, we have to talk about society. We have to um, ensure that the language is systems-based and we have to ensure that we're shifting the narrative and the blame on the institutions and the governments and the businesses that profit off and the poor health uh, of our nation. So I think we're realising the power of businesses. We're realising the importance of 
businesses in really changing uh, diets for people, realizing that our taste buds are manufactured by companies at a young age and young children are addicted to sugar. All of this is happening, policy is being changed. Jamie's been a massive advocate for changing policy and he realizes that you know, government policy dictates businesses and their strategy. And so if we can come to a place where businesses by law can't advertise, for example, mm -hmm. unhealthy foods, mm -hmm. then automatically consumers will find that the less enticing option. And it was actually Jamie working with Paul Pomeroy at McDonald's way back in about 2017 when I did that mm -hmm. interview with the, the two of them that made those changes at McDonald's. So oh, wow. it does work. My last question, um, Greta Thunberg has said that she's really mm -hmm. cross that it has to fall to the young people to make these big changes. Do you feel cross or do you feel empowered? Good question. <laughs> I think I'm going to refer back to my House of Commons speech uh, where I spoke about climate change and I linked it with health and said how change is not passive. It comes from all of us. We all have to stand together to really impact change and we all have to uh, beat the drum through collective action. Of course, I paraphrase that. But really, I think when I'm campaigning with my friends who all have lived experiences of in this growing up in the system, I do feel empowered when I'm in those meetings with a lot of businesses and I see the real want for them to change, the real, you know, the, from them themselves saying that there needs to be change. I am empowered. Uh, and then there are these occasional moments where I'm cross. I see instead of progress, uh, we're, we're instead of going forward and making progress, we're going backwards. I think with this government, we've seen a lot of that in terms of food. And over the past year, we've seen a lot of food progress be kind of broken down and it's kind of going back to a place where we didn't want to be. So seeing other young people as passionate, speaking from their lived experience makes me empowered. Seeing people in power actually wanting to do the right thing makes me empowered. But then seeing the wrong thing happen and seeing you know, the kind of corporatization of common sense, clearly the wrong thing happening and even the companies admitting, but using shady tactics and corporate language to kind of cover that up makes me really, really cross. But then it just makes me more empowered to create change and to change the system and reform it. Thanks for listening. You can find much more about the food campaigning that Dev and I do by listening to the Food Foundation podcast. You can also follow Dev and me on Instagram. He's devsharma.myp and I'm at Foodjilly Smith. And I've just joined Substack where you can get extra Cooking the Books content every single week. Find me there. I'm Jilly Smith. See you next week. Bye.